Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the past week. We have a couple of big news items this week, including discussion on NVIDIA's GeForce Partner Program, uh, some Coffee Lake functionality on Z170 and Z270 previous motherboards, and a couple of other cool things, along with a mini review of a Noble chair that we got in the mail. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly, makers of the Conductonaut liquid metal that we recently used to drop 20 degrees off of our Coffee Lake temperatures. Thermal Grizzly also makes traditional thermal compounds for use on top of the IHS, like Cryonaut and Hydronaut pastes. Learn more at the link below. The big news item for this past week was from Hard OCP from site owner Kyle Bennett, who broke a story about uh, discussions on board vendors pertaining to an NVIDIA branding initiative, a newer NVIDIA branding initiative. And the report makes several strong points, including one that we'll just quote for you. The crux of the issue with the NVIDIA GPP comes down to a single requirement in order to be part of the GeForce Partner Program. In order to have access to the Partner Program, its partners must have its gaming brand aligned exclusively with GeForce. Bennett stated, I have read documents with this requirement spelled out on it, NVIDIA will tell you that it is 100% up to its partner company to be part of the GPP, and from the documents I've read, if it chooses not to be part of the program, it will lose the benefits of GPP, which include high effort engineering engagements, early tech engagement, launch partner status, game bundling, sales rebate programs, social media and PR support, marketing reports, marketing development funds, and further stating MDF is likely to stand out in the list of lost benefits if the company is not a GPP partner. The concern raised in the hard OCP story primarily pertains to gaming brands, so that would not be the AIB partner as a company, but their products sold for graphics devices. So uh, following the example that Kyle Bennett set, we'll point to ROG. There's no indication of any kind that ROG specifically is involved with this, uh, but it's an example he raised, so we will further that. A an example of a gaming brand would be, for example, the ROG Ares series or ROG Strix, ROG Mars, whatever other series they have. Uh, those would be the brands. So in theory, from what Bennett's story states, uh, the potential restriction would be that these brands are locked to NVIDIA GPUs and could not be applied toward AMD GPUs. And that's the primary concern of the story. So this would obviously not apply to single party vendors. If you are uh, a manufacturer who makes components only for NVIDIA, there's really no impact here because uh, the theory of it all is that this is a partner program which, uh, which primarily by Kyle's writing would restrict access to information if you sold a same branded component for AMD devices as for NVIDIA devices. That's sort of what the story lays out and uh, the write-up will be listed in our news sources article that we'll post below as always if you want to read more on that. So, Hard OCP and its off-record contacts have raised concern about legality of the program. They've also insinuated potential anti-competitive practices for the NVIDIA GPP, which was just detailed in greater depth in NVIDIA's own blog a couple of days ago. And we haven't been able to open dialogue with any of our contacts about this story on or off record. So at this time, we can provide no additional information. What you have is basically hard OCP's story at this time. A few months ago, we reported on a story about Coffee Lake becoming functional, sort of, on one of the older motherboards, so a non-Z370 board. And this was done by an overclocker who managed to more or less hack something together. Today, there's news on an overclocker managing to get Coffee Lake CPUs basically fully functional on the Z100 series motherboards, including an i3 8th generation CPU. At the time previously, when we reported the initial attempts at this, nothing much could really be done other than a boot and some basic validation. But now, uh, the overclock.net forum post by Root Moto goes on to state that, quote, Coffee Lake is now completely working on 100 and 200 series motherboards. So far, Core i3-8100 has been tested working completely on the 100 series boards and the user goes on to credit contributions from various team members on the project. The team posted a guide on how to do this on the WinRaid forum, if you're interested. There are four primary steps to the process of getting Coffee Lake working 
on previous boards. First, you need a UEFI BIOS updater. You need an Intel binary modification program, a vBIOS and BSF package, and the AMI UEFI MM tool, which is another software utility. The guide also provides instructions on which binaries and batch files need to be modified or changed to allow insertion of the Coffee Lake microcode uh, to further allow bootable 8th generation CPUs on 100 and 200 series boards. It's not guaranteed to work, but it's worth a shot for anyone who has an old board and is trying to figure out how to make it work with the new CPUs, maybe save some money. A few sites pointed out an Intel oddity on the Graphics Bench website this week. It's a CPU named the i7-8670, which Graphics Bench claims to have 12 threads and 6 cores. There's no guarantee that this is an accurate specifications listing, and it would be sort of out of character for Intel to create an i7 CPU with the second digit being a 6, as is the case with 8670. Parts in the last few generations with a 6 in that specific location in the name have been Core i5 CPUs. So we have some indication that the 8670 is real, but it's not fully clear on the specs at this time. Either way, if we assume that any of this information is correct, it looks like the CPU is a 3.1 gigahertz base clock with 6 cores and 12 threads, likely selling at a price, one would assume, between an 8600K and an 8700-non-K CPU. There have also been a lot of slides for Ryzen of debated legitimacy over the past week. Uh, so this is kind of following up in the same rumor segment. The 8670 is more or less a rumor, and this stuff is too. But uh, there are a lot of slides out now for an alleged Ryzen 2000 series launch. And the newest rumor indicates a Threadripper follow-up potentially sooner than we'd expect, aiming at 2018 if the slides are to be believed. And the rumor indicates that this hypothetical thread of her part would be a part of the Ryzen 2000 series architecture and changes to that architecture. One thing we can say uh, with certainty is that the major Ryzen 2000 series announcements will be happening soon, about a month from now, sometime shortly after PAX East. So keep an eye out for all of that. For some quick game news that's related to hardware, if anyone has forgotten, Steam is owned by Valve and Valve used to be a game developer. Uh, so, recent news is that Gabe Newell hosted a discussion at Valve's offices and was quoted by PC Gamer as saying the following of its new game. Quote, Artifact is the first of several games that are going to be coming from us, so that's sort of good news. Hooray! Valve's going to start shipping games again. It's a very uh, jovial from Newell there. Interestingly, Newell also commented that Valve is sort of jealous of Nintendo for their ability to produce hardware and software for their games. And this was primarily pointed out as uh, being worthy of envy because when, as Newell said, when Miyamoto wants to design a new game, he can look at the input options and the mechanics options and then design the two around each other, which is something that Valve has wanted to do for a while now rather than be bound to existing input modes like mice and keyboards. So uh, this goes on to a further and bigger discussion of their HTC Vive headset, which is Valve developed, and coincides with previous statements from Valve that they are working on at least a couple of major VR titles coming out sometime soon, TM. Maybe with Half-Life 3 or one of the other games that never came out. For those curious, Artifact appears to be a card game that's got some vague similarities to Hearthstone, and that's the one that they're primarily discussing right now, but Newell did pretty heavily indicate that Valve is attempting to return to game development in a bigger way. This one's sort of interesting, and it might, might, might please some of you because it includes the harm of crypto miners that you've all been very vocal about. Uh, the Associated Press ran a story that a crypto mining company located in Iceland had 600 computers stolen in a robbery. Given that this is coming from the Associated Press, there's not a whole lot of technical understanding to much of anything, uh, as it is more of a mainstream press outfit. So we don't know what the word computer means in this context. We don't know if that's 600 video cards or if that's 600 combinations of motherboard CPU RAM that then had multiple video cards attached to them. Either way, the thing that matters is that the uh, equipment was worth an estimated $2 million dollars and was stolen in Reykjavik in Iceland. The police commissioner locally noted that the theft appears to be a highly organized crime and one that occurred or began in December, but they hadn't disclosed until recently because they were trying to find 
the thieves. So uh, another source indicated that the police are looking at power consumption across the country to try and identify a likely source for a new mining operation, though tracking fenced sales would be a bit harder, one would assume, unless they've got all the serial numbers written down. But either way, if you're in Iceland and you recently came across millions of dollars of components, probably don't hook it up to the grid because they're looking for you. Next one, NZXT has a new X72 360 millimeter cooler and a new 120 millimeter cooler from a non azatec supplier for once. NZXT's new coolers coming up are again 360 for the 72, which is part of the X62 and 52 family, and 120 for the M22, whose supplier we haven't yet identified, but it's the same OEM as for Raid Max, if you've seen their coolers. The X72 uses Asetek cooling hardware, that would be the Generation 5 pump, as far as we're aware, which is the same as the X62 is presently using, and the M22, again, will detail once we know more about it. And just as a bit of a downer, we have some memory pricing news for you. At the beginning of 2018, there were reports suggesting that memory prices should start declining sometime relatively soon. In a new report from Digitimes, prices are speculated to rise, sorry, 5 to 10% in the first half of 2018, with increased demand from data center and smartphone market segments. Additionally, Goldman Sachs reinforced the suspected DRAM price trend in a note to investors, and the company also noted that supply appears to remain constrained, and that 32 gigabyte server modules being priced at $310 to $315 are up from about $300 back in January. Overall, this echoes the most recent DRAM exchange forecast, which expects DRAM supply to remain tight with strong demand, as well as expecting DRAM revenue to increase by more than 30% in 2018, reaching $96 billion. All the big players, that would be Samsung, Hynix, and Micron, are planning on ramping up DRAM output for 2018 and 2019, with 2017 being a historic year for DRAM prices and growth. An infusion of new memory supply to the market could offset the high prices to an extent, but not the high demand. For perspective, our writer who worked on this particular story, Eric Hamilton, purchased a G-Skill Trident Z 16 gigabyte DDR4 kit, 3200 MHz, in March of 2016, two years ago now, for $99. The same kit today is sold for $211. So a good investment if you're looking to sell. Uh, additionally, we did publish a brief history on RAM prices recently from 2011 to 2018. If you're interested in more examples of this and the trajectory of the market, we have a content piece for you on the channel. And finally, just sort of a mini review from us. We're not sure what we're planning to do with chairs, but gaming chairs are certainly one of the more important parts of a setup. It's just hard to cover them. If you have requests, let us know. What we'll do for now though, is we recently, uh, after CES, got a chair from Noble in the mail as a review sample, and it's a Noble Icon chair. I believe it's a $370 chair, and uh, recently, not long ago, we purchased a, an office chair that was about the same price. So, uh, what about comparing the two? The Icon is not too dissimilar from a lot of the other gaming chairs on the market presently. Most of the chairs right now use either the same or a very similar supplier for things like the armrests, uh, the four-dimensional, they all call it arm adjustment functionality, and uh, the base and the chair materials aren't too different either. So for an example, Vertigear, HyperX, Corsair, Thermaltake, all those chairs for the suppliers of the components I just listed are more or less the same. The Noble chair does have a couple of familiar components on it just like those do. Uh, overall, it's we're, we're a bit mixed on it. So uh, after using it for a few weeks now, Certainly, the body position is better for me in terms of, uh, of posture than my previous office chair, which was a bit too wide. But uh, I would like to see some of these gaming chairs start doing slightly more padded, if not fully padded, armrests. Most of them use a harder plastic, which uh, if you're working for way more hours a day than you should be, really starts to feel kind of bad on your elbows. So I'd like to see that with some of these chairs. I may mod it and just add some kind of foam to it. But uh, beyond that, the chair itself was exceptionally easy to assemble, which is something that I absolutely hate with buying any chairs when they take forever to build. Uh, 
It is the same basic assembly process as the Vertigear chairs we've had, except it has a few more screws pre-installed. Once you're using it, the comfort is extremely subjective, but it's better than our uh, office chair we purchased that I can't recall the name of. And it's really not that different from the Vertigear SL2000 chair that we have. So if you like those, Noble's kind of in the same bracket in terms of how it feels to use. It is a, a vinyl or a fake leather chair. You can get a real leather version if you're really serious about, I guess, uh, racing style seating. The pillow material they selected for it is great as a foam. It, it is pretty comfortable, actually. The pillow positioning is a bit odd because the lower pillow doesn't have a means to lock into place anywhere. So you more or less just kind of like wedge it into the back of the chair and leave it there. And then every time you get up or sit down, you have to relocate it or just give up and sit on top of the pillow. Uh, so that could be improved, but uh, the pillow itself is actually pretty good compared to some of the Vertigear ones we've used, which are mostly annoying because of the uh, fake leather wrap around all of them. So yeah, I, I'm not too sure what we can do with chair related content. It is an important and extremely important part of the setup, but it's one that uh, we're looking for your feedback on what do you want to see? If we made a video about gaming chairs, gaming chairs versus perhaps standard office chairs, what would you want to see in the lineup? And what would you like compared or uh, remarked about between them? As far as the Noble chair, the Icon, overall, I certainly prefer its, uh, we'll call it ergonomics and body position to my previous chairs. It's definitely a bit better for, uh, for the way I mean, the way I sit there forever, it's better for my back. Uh, I do really want to see cushioned armrests, though. That's big for me, and it seems like no one makes it. So uh, I, I would say mostly positive with some pretty major criticisms that apply to basically all gaming chairs on the market. So Noble, if you're watching, the way to really stand out from your competitors is be the only chair company that makes gaming chairs that chooses a different supplier. And I know that's probably pretty hard, uh, but hopefully you can do it because I'd like to see someone differ from the rest of the pack making the same chair. So that's it for this one. As always, you can subscribe for more. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Do leave a comment, let us know what you wanna see for chair content. We'll probably do like one video and that's it. So let me know, because I want it to be kind of a, an end all be all for us so we can focus on the other content. Uh, store.gamersnexus.net to back order one of our mod mats. They will begin shipping the second round by end of this month or early April. So pretty soon, uh, our first round sold out basically instantly. So uh, back order now if you want one. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.